Uh, the first slide, when we get it, uh, is the uh, central projection of the Office of the Actuary. I'm sure you are all familiar with it, uh, and you're familiar with the actuarial deficit of 2.83 percent, and 2034 is the magic year when we get a 23 percent benefit cut across the board with no legislation in between, and that cut gets slowly larger after that. So once we get through that, once the baby boomers uh, are starting to phase out, the, the explosion that we've had in costs uh, doesn't go on as further and further explosions. So there it is. Now what I want to do uh, is focus on political economy. And so I want to I ask the question, uh, what factors seem to matter a lot that we got 77 legislation, and how did that look going forward? 77 legislation was not at the last minute before it was about to run out. 83, we got legislation at the last minute when it was going to run out, uh, and I'm going to focus on that as the most likely scenario going forward. Uh, and then we had three presidents making a serious attempt to change Social Security and all failing. I'm not going to say much about that, just to remind you of it. Uh, and then I'm going to um, focus on legislation before 2034. And if it's 2033, are we going to see Social Security borrowing from the Treasury? I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about why as we get there. And then the one policy thing I want to put in is the current debate about the cost of living adjustment it seems to me to be absolutely the wrong debate. It's not framed in an appropriate way. And so I'll get to that. So here is the um, 1973 on um, trustees' reports. And as you all know, 72 gave us over-indexing. The system exploded after that. Uh, and what, one of the things you see here is the actuarial balance um, got very large and very quickly and was continuing to trend up. So I think the, a major factor for Congress focusing on it, which it did very promptly, I started working on Social Security in 1974 on the first Shao panel asked by the Senate Finance Committee, uh, should we believe what the Office of the Actuary is telling us? The Office of the Actuary, of course, knew it was over-indexed and said so, uh, but unfortunately the then Chief Actuary Trowbridge said at the inflation rates we're used to, this is not a big problem. 72 was the wrong time to rely on future low inflation, so it all exploded. And as you see from looking at the trust fund ratio four years ahead, this wasn't a last minute thing. So uh, I think a major part of getting that was the horrific set of changes in the actuarial imbalance. And uh, the Boston College Center for Retirement Research took the current uh, actuarial report, uh, trustees report, and just adding gears on toward the end, uh, naively extrapolating and changing nothing earlier, did the calculation of what would be uh, the actuarial deficit year by year if the trustees reports didn't change anything in the projection process. And as you see, obviously it goes up noticeably, but it's nothing like the explosion it was in the 70s, and it never gets nearly as large as happened in the 70s. So this is not going to motivate Congress as split as it is over what to do to actually come to do it. They're not going to be frightened enough uh, for that, is my political guess. Remember, I'm an economist, not a political scientist. I just ad lib. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, what the 77 legislation did. Um, the actuarial deficit was so large they didn't even get it down to zero for right off the bat. Uh, and 
they believed, which was one of the other elements that made the legislation possible, that with the coming of the baby boomers into the labor force, the short term looked pretty good. They had to do a little tinkering, and then they would get into the period where, uh, what we've seen with hindsight, large surpluses were built up in anticipation uh, of later retirements. Uh, so again, we don't have a picture like that. Here are the annual deficits. Uh, they get large and get larger and get larger. We don't have a grace period where we can say we don't have to do anything for a while. We'll just phase things in slowly. Obviously, if you act before 2034, you have some time to phase things in. Uh, but that's not there. In contrast, uh, this is the 82 trustees report. Uh, and as you can see, um, they just had a short hurdle uh, to get through. And that will be very different going forward. So it's going to be a very hard problem if we get to 2033. I want to say a little bit about what did happen in response. And as everybody knows, the Greenspan Commission uh, was appointed. And the first thing that they did, and, and that's what the uh, Senate Finance asked the Shao panel to do, is come in and tell us how big the problem is. And what's important politically, which the Shao panel is just an outside panel couldn't do, but an inside commission could, it becomes the political definition of the problem you're trying to address. And so I think it's important when we get to 2033 to have a commission. And the first job is to get an agreement on what it is they're trying to do. Uh, the um, short run, uh, the commission put together a plan. I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, the COLA uh, delay, the uh, taxing benefits, the adding in new federal and nonprofit employees, uh, and stopping states from pulling out, which they had been doing. Um, but they couldn't agree on a long-run solution. And so you see here, um, eight of the appointees were on the left, and that included Democrats appointed by President Reagan. So it was who did the appointment, not what party you were in that made a difference. And uh, what we see here is the familiar pattern. One party says, let's do everything by cutting benefits. And the other party says, let's do everything by raising taxes. And so the question is, what were they going to do going forward uh, with that kind of split? And what they decided to do was to have a relatively balanced proposal come out of Social Security Ways and Means, which was headed by J.J. Pickle and was passed on to the floor by Ways and Means. And the Rules Committee, which was headed by Claude Pepper, uh, agreed the rule would be there'd be two amendments allowed, and that was it. So here are the two amendments. Uh, Pickle got one and Pepper got one. And uh, Pickles was what we ended up with, everything being done on benefit cuts. And as you can see, the Republicans were practically lockstep in favor of that and opposed to the tax increase alternatives and the Democrats were split all over the place. And keep in mind, if you look at the dates, this is a debate which is doing things way out in the future. So it's not anything unlike the other parts uh, which were hitting people right away. This was something which was really capturing their sense of what they wanted to do without a whole lot of political pressure on them. And it was invisible. I only learned about this uh, when I was asked in January uh, to talk about the future of Social Security. And I started doing some reading. Uh, if this wasn't visible to me, I'm not sure how many members of the general public were weighing in with their congressmen about how they wanted this uh, to go. So what happened 
is the short run and long run balances were very different. Part of this was the choice of pickle over pepper. Part of it was the fundamental difference in the way they did the additional revenues and the way they did the additional benefit cuts. The COLA delay and the taxation of benefits were permanent changes. So it had a long run impact. The payroll tax rate increases that were already on the books were brought earlier. So there was no long run change in the payroll tax. And that gives a significant part of that imbalance. So uh, picture it now. It's 2033. And we're um, looking ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot a slide, key slide. Uh, I didn't know this book existed until I started working on this. Uh, and I pulled it up and read it. And uh, Bob, all this, he gave me so little time, I would otherwise have brought a page of quotes from Bob Ball's book. But Bob Ball said, people think the Greenspan Commission was a great success solving the problem. That is totally wrong. The commission split, unable to come to an agreement. And the president appointed James Baker. And the speaker appointed Bob Ball. They gathered in a few other members of the commission. Uh, and some outsiders, and they negotiated a short-run deal. And then they had the job of selling it to the commission, so the commission could agree to it and they could take it to Congress. So instead of the commission solving the problem for the principals, the principals solved the problem for the commission. Uh, I roll that out because I think we need a commission in 2033 if we get there, and I think we will get there. Uh, but we shouldn't think of that as a simple uh, solution. If we do that, it will take care of everything. So picture 2033. Uh, obviously, the, some people, uh, the kind of people who like the idea of not increasing the debt limit, uh, might be liking the idea of threatening the 23 percent payroll cut across the board. And as with the debt limit, a lot of the members of Congress worried about re-election uh, thinks this is a bad idea. So I've heard people say if we get to that point, um, then of course it's much harder to cut benefits for the already retired. Benefit cuts get phased in more slowly than tax increases need to get phased in. And so letting it slide is something that will help protecting benefits by getting more revenues. I think that is wrong. And the reason I think that is wrong is because when we get to that point, the solution which will put them on an even footing is to have Social Security borrow from the Treasury with full payback in the actuarial evaluation and, and the law requiring it out of future benefit cuts, future revenue increases. I think this will be irresistible. Now, there was a brief period when Social Security or the OSDI trust fund, I'm not sure which of the two was more in trouble, uh, was allowed to borrow from the HI trust fund. Uh, it was small amounts. It was temporary. Um, it's not, I don't think of it as a precedent. What I do think is a precedent is the proposals that had individual accounts recognized they had what is euphemistically called a transition problem. You know, if you're borrowing for 50 or 60 years, transition seems like a um, political word. Um, anyway, the, we saw the proposals um, under the pro-individual account part of the Clinton Advisory Council, not counting the, the Gramlich proposal, which only had one additional supporter. And we saw the Bush Presidential Commission going for borrowing from the Treasury big time. Beyond that, pretty much every individual account proposal was for borrowing from the Treasury because you couldn't do it otherwise. I think 
borrowing from the Treasury is an idea that has been accepted by one of the two parties, and the other party will find it irresistible because the alternative looks too politically awful. Even if you could do everything on tax increases, a large, sudden four percentage point payroll tax increase, not good for the macro economy, not welcomed by the workers who vote. So that's the way I think it will go. And then the question is, what kind of political struggle will we have uh, going forward out of that? Uh, first, the small uh, piece. Uh, there are two full proposals that restore actuarial balance, sustainable solvency uh, that you can find on uh, the OACT website. Uh, Sam Johnson is the chairman of the Social Security Subcommittee of Ways and Means. Uh, John Lawson is the ranking Democrat on that committee. So these are coming from uh, the prime players and if we were serious about doing something now. And no surprise, they're rather radically different. Um, Johnson has no payroll tax change. Uh, Larson increases revenues by enough to be increasing benefits. And we look at benefits. Um, the uh, Johnson approach is, with the exception of doing th something for a special minimum, um, connects to the earlier sessions, I guess, um, is doing things that make things look better, except he had so much money he could do away with the taxation of benefits, uh, which is not exactly targeted on the low earners. Uh, Larson, on the other hand, is doing benefit increases in each of these categories out of a lot of finances. What kind of fight we will have over this um, is unclear, uh, but I think it's not going to be pretty. The COLA moves are, are moving in the opposite direction, and that's something we've seen a lot of debate about. Uh, current is CPIW. That was the only one that existed in 72. Um, Johnson wants the chain CPI, which Office of the Actuary says will lower the COLA, and recognizes that perhaps compounding that out for 20 years might not be such a good idea, so puts in an additional benefit increase after you've been on the rolls 20 years. Larson goes for the CPI for the elderly, which is labeled experimental, um, and uh, gets criticized for not being an accurate measure of a cost of living index, the way the chained one is. So uh, I, wanna, I was intrigued by the difference, and I went and I took out the fat volume uh, that the, our, the two national academies had put together an excellent panel looking at measuring the CPI and how it affects things. And this was really in part a response to the Boskin Commission and the push to lower the COLA on the grounds that the CPI was not well measured. And first of all, they make the point, if, if all you're concerned about is the economist's ideal inflation pushing up all the prices, you can do it with a cost of goods index. You don't need a cost of living index. And the book, as you see right up front, uh, says that it's important to understand what you measure, how you measure it, and how that might or might not relate to your policy issues. And that's what I want to briefly talk about. What is a cost of living index? It takes an idealized representative consumer and says if you have exactly the same indifference curves in year one and year two, and prices have changed and qualities have changed in a way they're offsetting the prices, then how do you change income? What's the problem with that? Well, the first of all, preferences changed. And let me tell you, well up in my 70s, I notice my preferences keep changing. <laughs> Secondly, um, they change for 
consumption, your own consumption history. They change depending on what other people are doing. Uh, the idea that this is an ideal for Social Security is, to my mind, misguided. Um, secondly, the representative consumer, well, how does that come about? It's based on total consumption of urban workers. And of course, the relevant inflation rates would be very different for different people. And so one thing you can do, this has been labeled a plutocratic cost of living index, because the more you consume, the more weight you get. What you could do if you had the information, say by percentile, is do a cost of living index separately, each one, and then take some kind of weighted average depending on which group you were more concerned about and which numbers were bigger. Quality adjustments, there's a big difference between what's fashion and what's a better product. And what's a better product is something people disagree on. So one example, uh, with automobiles, something that's an option in one year becomes standard in the next year. And the way they calculate the price difference adjusted for quality is they add the cost of the option to the cost of the automobile in the first year and compare it to the cost of the automobile with the option in the next year. The um, trouble with that is some fraction of people didn't take the option. So for them, that's not a correct measurement of quality. And if you do things like latest iPhone and you're getting it because other people are getting it and you don't actually care a whole lot about its services, that's a fashion element. And for fashions, they don't say what the idealized measure would do. The one that breaks me up is think about bestseller books. In Canada, which is easy to find out what they do, they take the price of bestsellers this year, the price of bestsellers last year. Ideally, you would think of each book as a separate product. And then what would happen is last year's bestsellers got remained, huge price drop. And this year's bestsellers were not available last year. Well, the, the theoretical way to solve it is to see at what price demand would have been zero. Another price drop. Obviously makes no sense. They don't do it. But that's the issue about fashion, that telling apart fashion from quality is not easy. So um, the price data comes from the retailers. So you can't break out the elderly or the percentiles with the detailed data. You can only look at the detailed data and then look at some other data to say, how do we want to weight these things uh, separately? And I don't know who thought up the term plutocratic index. This is, again, pulled from uh, the book. Um, so uh, what, do we, what do we want to see with retirement benefits? Well, it seems the first thing is um, we should ask, do we want to have people bearing the costs associated with quality increases as well as price increases, quality interest that they're not interested in? And the place this get, uh, gets talked about is health care. Health care is the biggest deal in the CPI for the elderly going up faster. And it doesn't measure it well because it doesn't have the detailed information on out of pocket. And obviously, quality is going way up. But do we want to say, as it's put uh, in one source I saw, if people are going to live longer, then that's a reason since they're better off for cutting their benefits. There may be a finances reason for having to do it, but that doesn't seem to make sense. And an additional element is, do you want the elderly somewhat keeping pace with um, the younger people? And do you want to do for annuities what we devote a lot of energy to in accumulation for retirement, thinking about what risks you want to take on, a risk return frontier. Would some people like an annuity with a, like you can get with a TIA CREF or Vanguard uh, that's based on what happens with stocks? Um, that's one of the options in Sweden. 
Uh, I think there are a lot of good research questions to answer the question, what do we want to do with this? And abroad, it's all over the place. So uh, Canada and France are like us, it's a price index. Uh, Norway and Sweden, it's a wage index minus a constant. In Sweden, the constant is their actuarial estimate of real wage growth. So it's aimed at the price index, but since the revenue is coming in out of wages, it's meant to cushion that. Norway has a much smaller subtraction from the price index. Uh, it's 1.6 in Sweden. I think it's 0.75 in Norway. So it's giving the elderly somewhat more uh, than the price index. Finland and Switzerland do a weighted average of the two. Um, in Finland, it's 80% prices, 20% wages. They also use an index like that in, uh, but reversed, uh, in adjusting your history to get initial benefits. Switzerland, in one piece, has 50-50. And the idea of saying some of the risk in the system can go to some of the elderly seems to me to make sense, and several countries have been building uh, that in. So uh, I've answered everything except the last item. Um, what, how can we get the public involved? Because as NASI has documented repeatedly, uh, getting the public views and the political views do not exactly line up. So the first thing to keep in mind, public doesn't like tax increases. This is James Madison writing in the debate to go from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, which would have given Congress the power to lay taxes, which they didn't have. Uh, and this was a hard sell. The Constitution was a near-run thing in some of the states. Um, so what does that mean politically? What it means is tax increase is not a word that any polit politician will say. So I took the uh, Larson press release that went with that report that I told you, and I looked to see did the word tax increase appear in his press release. Uh-uh. <laughs> Ensuring strong, that's a euphemism. Um, this is a New Yorker cartoon. The guy on the desert island is saying, forget about me, save Social Security. Uh, and again, the surveys, Social Security is a program people care about. Um, so do you see uh, Johnson saying anything about benefit cuts in his press release? Uh, no, he's going to modernize, update, insure, and target. Each of those is a benefit cut. So what, I asked myself the question, is there any way to get the public to weigh in more? Which is tough because the public doesn't know a whole lot, as we were hearing earlier today, uh, and the politicians aren't terribly eager to get them fully informed. So um, I was struck by uh, this way that the Bipartisan Center put together a panel of, of very knowledgeable people on Social Security, uh, and they were given the charge 50-50. And uh, the open, practically the opening sentence of the report is nobody on this panel supports what we've recommended. <laughs> That's the way it should be. <laughs> uh, so it struck me saying what mix of revenue changes and benefit changes do you favor, as question asked, a congressman in the election before 2033? See if the League of Women Voters can make it the kind of question that it's hard to not answer. And see whether um, the um, public will pick up on this, maybe asking for a number is not good survey, you could give them a choice, at least 50-50 or at most 50-50, which, whichever one you make, make the first, to get the public aware this is what the fight will be about. And I give FDR the last word. This is a photograph from the FDR memorial here. So now we have some time for, for questions. I must have been really opaque. 
Yeah, Let, that's enough. Let, um, <laughs> there are things happening to increase and improve uh, savings outside Social Security, and I'm a big fan uh, of these uh, things that imitate uh, what the UK has done with Nest. They have a requirement that employers have to have a program. Workers can opt out, but it's an opt out, not an opt in. And the government is willing to take on all the administrative duties for a small employer or a large employer. And they've done a really good job of simplifying accumulation choices. So there are things to do. I, I, I wasn't given two hours, so. But yes, I think it's important to pay attention to all the legs. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I think it's in instructive that you ended up with uh, FDR and his kind of construction of what he was trying to achieve with the social security system. And part of what he gave us was this whole concept of social insurance, which is kind of the raison d'etre of the academy. Um, where we don't call what we put into the system taxes, or he didn't, and the framers didn't, and the people who encouraged him to create this kind of system didn't. They called them contributions, and they were mandatory. But, the, but it, was, it was viewed as you know, your stake in the system that everybody pays in, et cetera. I don't, I don't have to explain all this to you. But it's a very different framing from the uh, taxes versus spending that is the budget language of our current discour discourse in, in Washington? Uh, two things. One is there are lots of proposals now, to, including one I'm talking about uh, in an hour, uh, that tap other sources than contributions from workers and their employers. And that certainly needs to be thought of as, as tax. Uh, secondly, uh, as much as I love the contribution vocabulary, I fear that ship has sailed. And in part, there's an audience out there that you won't reach unless you talk in the vocabulary they want to talk about. So the other, the, the actual slide I had uh, drawing on your work was divided things that affected beneficiaries, things that affected um, contributors. Uh, and uh, it's a good vocabulary. I wasn't sure how well going to my end point that would get to the general public. Benefit cut, I think, is, is a very clear idea as a, ch again, we have a fight over benefit cut. Some people say benefit cut is future benefits being lower than current benefits as opposed to future benefits being lower than legislation. And I'd be perfectly happy to see it called contributions. Uh, personally, I have trouble remembering to do that. Um, I'm the League of Women Voters. Uh, Mr. Diamond, what is the contribution and benefit changes uh, ratio that you would like to see? Um, <laughs> more than 50% on the tax side. I, I think the important thing here is we're, we're seeing positions staked out, which is part of the political process. And then we see some kind of process in the middle. And different people play different roles in that process. Um, Personally, I'm more comfortable playing a middle role, so my answer depends on how I read the political wins at the time. Uh, and the idea, uh, I mean, and, and this is what Peter Orzag and I did when we worked on our book, uh, was trying to say what kind of package would we put together that wouldn't be accused of being a left-wing package? What can we do, we called it a balance package, it was our sense of balance, and, and there were certainly critics that said their sense of balance was different. But we got through um, the point where we weren't being accused of imbalance, just of the wrong balance, which I think got it a bit more attention. <laughs> 
than would have otherwise. Uh, so I think if I'm running for Congress in 2033, I'll, I'll probably try to duck that question. 